Together at the Table, the podcast from Integrity Music, where people around the world sit at their tables and talk about life in all its colors. Not to judge, but to love, share, listen, and learn. Whether you're rich or poor, we all sit at a table. And when we gather, everyone has a part to play in the conversation. So join us now as we share stories together at the table. Welcome to Together at the Table, the podcast from Integrity Music that brings you inspiring conversations with remarkable individuals. I'm Andrew Phillips, your host, and today I'm talking with Tim Timmons, a worship leader and songwriter. Uh, Tim Timmons' life has always been one of adventure, and after two decades of ministry and a lifetime of looking for Jesus, he's no stranger to pain, sorrow, failure, joy, and hope, having fought a cancer diagnosis for over 20 years. Since his debut album released in 2013, his music has been coloured by a newfound purpose of living each day to its fullest, practising a full life with Jesus. Tim started a non-profit weekly encouragements and a podcast called 10,000 Minutes with the premise of inspiring, inviting and equipping people to practise joining Jesus all week long. Uh, he's married to Hillary, with whom he has four children, two daughters and two sons. And Tim's greatest desire, whether the catalyst is his cancer diagnosis, his theology, his podcast or his songs, is to keep the conversation going so people can discover for themselves the real life found in Jesus. Tim, welcome to the table. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. This podcast is based on Luke eleven thirty seven. 37 where Jesus had finished speaking and a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. And one of the things I like to do at the beginning of the show is get the guest to actually invite Jesus to the table. So would you pray now and invite Jesus to our table? Oh gosh, with my eyes open, I just say, Jesus, we're going to join you today. So thanks that we get to hang at your table. Um, all of us listening or sitting at this table. What an honor. Hmm. Amen. Amen. I want to start with by talking about the table you work at. Tell me about your how you work. You know, that table that you sit at every day and become Tim Timmons. Tell me about it. Whew. Well, I'm really good looking because I'm bald. And <laughs> so Jesus, Jesus was bald. And so I feel like we're, we're starting off well. Okay. That's all I'm saying. Um, gosh, what table do I... St- st- how, uh, give me more on that question. Okay, so... If you were defining your work uh, at a table you work at, yeah. you know, like the irony is that Jesus was a carpenter, so he actually made tables. Yeah. So he he probably knew what, it, what they were like. He made them and he sat on them. So you work on a daily basis and, and you know, figuratively speaking, you come to a table of work. Yeah. So what do you do? Yeah. I mean, I really have, uh, I really have three um, jobs, if you will, that are part of my table. And then my home is a table. Um, my, my kids playing basketball with my kids is a table. Hmm. Um, I go on walks with guys um, most mornings. Um, uh, and that sounds like a real Christian term, like we're walking together. <laughs> but I just mean we literally go on walks. Um, and that to me is a table um, where we're just hanging out and we are doing it, joining Jesus as we're on a walk. Um, yeah, I get to write songs and try to figure out how do we write these prayers that we're singing, um, mm-hmm. that I get to sing and that we, the church, get to sing all week long. Um, so that's part of my table. Um, I get to do that with other people. So part of that is, you know, co-writing is a really fascinating uh, experience because you're really sitting around with your instruments, but you're really at a table together, whether there's a table or not. Because you're going through, here are the things I'm struggling with. Here's mm-hmm. how I see that Jesus and who we are as the church, not just as individuals. I mean, it's just really where you like hash out, um, agree and disagree on things and then say, okay, now what prayer can we write 
and can we pray out of this? Mm -hmm. um, so I love that table. Um, I get to, uh, you know, do podcasts uh, for my 10,000 minutes uh, ministry uh, nonprofit um, and a bunch of things, which is so fun just to be curious. I'm, I really want to hang out with curious people. Hmm. Um, I guess I've just been around a religious side of things with a lack of curiosity. And gosh, the table is filled with curiosity. Food in and of itself, if we just started there, I actually want to do a, a podcast with just curious people, which would be hmm. uh, chefs and artists and different people. And like, hey, what's it look like to just create and be curious about food or whatever? Yeah. So, yeah, that um, – then I'm a, I'm a part of a uh, – which I never thought I would be again, um, a local church community. Um, and I'm a part-time pastor at this <laughs> local church here in Nashville. And it's been so beautiful. And the only thing we do, um, the whole community that is based on the table, actually. Hmm. So if you say, hey, do you have small groups? Do you have they're like, nope, all we have are tables. Um, so I think we could hang out and go bowling, you and me. Uh, you know, but it's just every week, every, every month, we have a new table. So I had people in my house two nights ago, a uh, group of 10 people that I didn't really know well. And now we do. And so every every month we're getting to know our church by just being a part of a table. So it's shoo. it's almost something we do every day in so many ways. You're right. I, I just love the way you've broken down there how many tables you have. I, I want to focus on one table, yeah, which is your family table. Yeah, let's talk about that. So that's the table that you and your two daughters, two sons, probably, yeah. and your wife yeah. meet at, and and friends. So talk to me about that table. What kind of traditions and approach do you have to that table? What do you what do you do always the same? Ooh, the same. I don't know what we do always the same. I think we ask a lot of questions. Um, that's kind of a hope and something that I hope my kids uh, come away with is the art of asking good questions to each other. Um, now I wish I would say, man, they, it's all my kids. They just we just sit and ask each other questions, which is just not true. Um, cause we're 16, 14, and then we had a surprise pregnancy, um, mm. that were twins. We call them the twins and that's the boy, girl twins they are 12. Um, so it's chaotic and crazy. And if the one thing that is the greatest joy in my life is parenting, the hardest thing I do is parenting in my life. Um, but yeah, I, I would say my hope is that they are, uh, they're seeing by example, what it looks like to be curious about each other. That's that they know that I'm curious about them because I love the, you know, I love them for all mm -hmm. the things. Um, yeah, I wish that I would say that we would, gosh, they would really love our prayer time and which would be amazing. Um, but I think we've tried to be less uh, dogmatic makes it sound bad. So I wish there was another word um, systematized on how we spiritually raise our kids it's just become part of the liturgy of our conversation um which i love which i think is a good thing and maybe in in 10 years i'll come back and go you guys don't do it that way you know because i think i was raised where in some ways in that time i was like if you have you guys all prayed together have you done all the things and it's like well praying i'm gonna open my eyes more when i pray it's just if it really is an all-day thing and you're with Jesus all week long, how do we just be with them all week long as a family? So. And you know how when you get to the table, you get to the table and yeah. you, you come from different perspectives, you know, jobs, work, school, whatever. Yeah. How do you prepare yourself to be at the table? The attitude that you want to have for your family and your kids? Yeah, uh, one, one practical thing is I write an X on my wrist every day. <laughs> Just with a Sharpie, you know, some doctor told me at one point, I said, am I going to get sick doing this? He's like, you might get Sharpie-itis. And I literally, I bit for a second. And I'm like, oh, you're being an idiot. You're totally joking. There's no such thing as Sharpie-itis. But I write this on my wrist for the past probably 12 years for a bunch of reasons. Uh, one of them is just I woke up again today, which I'm not supposed to be here just for hmm. cancer diagnosis and what's still in my body. But I got another day and I get to hang with you at this table at this moment. 
mm-hmm. and celebrate that. And if I get to be at my next table at a next meeting or whatever, wow. then awesome. Mm. Um, but this is what I got in this moment. This is where I am. Mm. So this is my reminder of like, Tim, don't go anywhere else. Just hang here, join Jesus at, in at this table. And that's your only job today, Tim. Hmm. <laughs> but I like move so quickly past that. And I get to a place of like, well, what about tomorrow? What about this other stuff? What about my finances? What about X, Y, and Z? And I lose the moment, being curious in the moment as I'm curiously sitting here with Jesus and with you. Hmm. Um, so that changes things. And I also say this often that um, with my ex, it's part of my sobriety. And I don't mean with alcohol or all the other things. I'm just, I get drunk on my daily circumstances Mm. or how my kids respond to something or don't respond to something. I literally get hammered, just all out drunk. And sobriety is saying, Jesus, what are you up to? I just want to join you in it. Like, what a waste for me to, like, let this take me out completely. So, hence me writing this on my wrist going, okay, Tim, you've got another day. Wow. It's not about you or your kingdom today. What a waste of time if it's about my kingdom today. You so, see, what, one of the things that Jesus did, I think, with tables, he spent a lot of time at them. Yeah. And people could bring whatever they were to that table and put it there. Hopefully leave it there. Yeah. But they brought it there. Can I ask you, how did you feel the day you brought cancer to your table and it changed your life and your family? Hmm. Ooh, um, next question. Hmm. No, uh, I don't know how to answer that other than that was one of the most sobering days of my life. Um, sobering seasons of my life. When you're told you've got five years to live, I was 22 or 23, I think 23. And yeah, gosh, there was so much in that season that I remember, um, I remember coming to this place of saying, okay, God, you're either God or you're not, hmm. you know, cause I, I, I was an awesome varsity American Christian up till that point. Just awesome. Hmm. Like try to beat me at being so awesome as being, at being a Christian, yeah. you know? Um, then it was like, uh Oh, does this thing work or is he God or is he not? Um, is he good or is he not? Hmm. Um, and then what's my response? Um, so that's kind of the place that I came to when that all hit. Um, I mean, so much more to that. I'm but, sure. Uh, yeah, it, it it wrecked it wrecked us in a lot of ways, and was also beautiful. Hmm. Um, yeah, my wife had a major wrestling match with God for a few years, and um, gosh, thankfully she did. I'm so happy that she did, and I was able to wrestle in a just a real vulnerable way that that was allowed. A question I'm almost frightened to ask. Yeah. And there is something personal with me. My dear father was a, a minister and he died of cancer Christmas Eve, mm. stage four for this three year? years, uh, Christmas last year. Oh, so sorry. Uh, wonderful man, beautiful man. And obviously he prayed for the pain to go away, Yeah, but it didn't, but he never lost his faith and hope in who God was, yeah. which I, have been impacted on dramatically. Yeah, I bet. I wanted to ask you, has the experience, do you think it's made you a better person or not? Uh, Yes. I wouldn't trade this for anything in the world. Now, with that asinine statement, Hmm. cancer is stupid. Cancer is so dumb. There's nothing awesome. I'm not, there's no celebration of cancer. Like, oh, you know, it was a good thing. Or really God wanted to give you this. You know, all the stuff that Christians say, oof, that's another podcast. Yeah. Um, That's a table I might turn over. Um, But I wouldn't trade what and who I've become and who I'm becoming in the midst of this. Um, And I think my wife would say, she would probably dare to say the same thing. Hmm. Um. I recently was teaching on the four soils that Jesus talks about and how, and I really see myself as all four soils all day long, really. But I was talking about the four soils and I was looking up soil and in the soil, it talked about manure. And I was like, well, that's cool. So I looked up manure, like who doesn't? 
And the definition of manure was the softening agent to harden soil. Wow. So I hear you. Manure happens. Hmm. And it's going to happen all the time. And it always is happening. If it's not happening right at the moment, wait a week, it's coming. And what do we do with it? Hmm. And not that we don't grieve. And I'm le- I'm learning how to grieve and be thankful at the same time. Hmm. Um, it's just it, part of my process. But what if manure happens, the stuff in life is actually one of the greatest gifts because it's the only way something actually grows beautiful is through manure. The other agent that it it talked about is that manure is the agent that holds all the nutrients Hmm. into the plant. The plant can grow beautifully and full because the manure is there. Because when the rains come and the wind comes, it holds all the nutrients together in the plant so the plant can stay alive and be more beautiful. I mean, I, I, I was floored by that idea. And so I, as I look at my stuff and I still say, God, please take this. And in the same breath, I'm saying, you woke me up again today. I don't know why I got to wake up again today. I don't know why you got to wake up again today. Whoever's listening, who knows why we got to wake up again. I don't know how God works. If he gives things, as he takes things away, I used to have all the answers. I don't have the answers anymore. But I do know that I woke up again today, and I get to join him in my day, period. Whatever table I'm at, I get to join him. I write this X on my wrist going, Tim, just join him. You don't have to work for him. Just join him today. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I appreciate that. I was going to ask you this then. You you, you described that the manure is the perfect soil for planting. So what did you plant? Uh, What did I plant? I don't know if I planted anything. I just know that I'm in manure. Okay. And my soil, or the four soils, mm-hmm. um, I'm wanting my soil to be, I'm wanting my plant and, and the fruit that comes off of my limbs. If I'm merely a branch mm-hmm. in John 15, if I'm, that's my role is just to be connected to the vine and that there's going to be manure that happens that helps that vine grow. I mean, we're mixing metaphors and, <laughs> and, and things, yet there's still some, mean. like, there's some beauty in there. So I don't know what I'm growing. I'm just trying to, like, be attached well. Hmm. And we all, I mean, the reason why so many of my friends are no longer following Jesus or part of the religious thing that we're somewhat affiliated <laughs> to, barely, I'm on the edge of it, um, is because stuff, manures happened And we as Jesus people have not had good answers. We've just given them some Christian quip and said, get over it, figure it out. God really must have, I mean, our friend, her brother just died. And all these Christian people are now reaching out to her saying, "Mm, God really needed another one in in heaven or whatever dumb stuff that Christians seem to say. And that poor friend is like on the edge going, really, is this what we're going to do? Is that the hospitality of a table? Is that sitting with Jesus at a table in the midst of our grief? How do we do that well? Gosh, I just went on a little tangent. but No, I love it. I agree with you 100%. Um, Jesus often dined with people. In fact, they said he was a friend of publicans and sinners, you know. Um, and tax collectors. And tax collectors. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the worst. That, exactly. Uh, but he spent time with the marginalized, you know, the people that nobody wanted. The people who weren't allowed at tables, he deliberately went to their tables, right? My question to you, Tim, is how do you get the marginalized to your table? Mm. Or do you? Mm. Yes. I think there are seasons of that in some ways in our lives. Um, Hillary and I, so I was a I was a pastor at a really large church in, in Orange County, California. And did that for 15 years, and it was a great experience. I just had a lot of questions about, okay— Jesus, number one, are you real? Um, And what do you care about? Because we're killing it on our Sunday morning services. I mean, killing it. But there are 10,000 other minutes until we gather again. And who are we? Who are the people that are here? We ended up leaving that church community, and and we went to this— 
we started going to this motel, this nasty motel in <laughs> near our town. And the motel had all these prostitutes and pimps and homeless people and people that would live in this motel, you know, 10 kids in this one motel room. And I was like, okay, she does that for a living, you know, with other dudes. I play a guitar for a living, but we're both trying to figure out if Jesus is real. And if the kingdom, blessed are the, the poor in spirit, the people that do not fit in our communities, like this woman who is a prostitute, she would not fit going to that community or into most places, Jesus places. And yet, gosh, what if that's the great invitation that I'm just on equal ground? I mean, that's the beauty of communion. If her and I are both taking communion, it's because we're both equal. So I, we, Hillary and I have really tried to figure out how do we stay in those places. And I really think Jesus would be hanging those places more than other spots. So, um, gosh, yeah, there are so many. I have so many thoughts about that. But that's so beautiful. And that is such a Jesus way. And also the marginalized. I mean, that can be a, a race comment. That can be the immigrants that are coming in, people that are not allowed here and loved here. I mean, that we get in some dirty, thick water here. But gosh, where would Jesus be? I, I don't know how protective he is of um, his rights. He surely was not, oh, I'll just say this. Jesus did not protect his rights. Hmm. But we Christians think our rights are something to hold on to and fight for. Yet the kingdom is about service. So anyways, ooh, you're getting the deep waters, different podcast. Hmm. But yes, Jesus is so beautiful and radical, and I want to be more in that vein and join him in those places. Hmm. My next question has like, is there's two parts to it, but I'll, I'll give it, and then you you work with it. But, you know, Tim, what, what do people say about you when you leave the table? And you can also answer that with what you'd like them to say yeah. about you when you leave the table. Because you it's not just your table. Yeah. You go to other people's tables. Yeah. So what what happens there? I hope people know that I actually cared about them. I mean, that, that's something I really hope that when I'm asking people questions, that they see, know that I care for them. That's huge. Hmm. Um, I'm a disruptor and an inviter. Um those are two words I want on my tombstone. Hmm. Um, and not in a in a lame way of like just poking holes in things to poke holes in them. But I just started watching how Jesus was such a disruptor of the religious norm, yet inviting into this bigger story. And so if I get to just have some kind of role in joining Jesus as he's probably already doing that, um, Hopefully he's still doing that in me. He's disrupt. He is disrupting things in me all the time. Yet inviting me into a bigger, um, into a bigger awareness. It's like I spend most of my life, like with a thimble, <laughs> of the fullness of God. Mm. He's like, dude, your religious stuff. You just need to let that go because there's a whole table and a bucket full of fullness. So my hope is that people would know that they're crazy loved, um, and that they might even see a representer of the way and heart of Jesus. That would be my hope. What a beautiful thought, though, that came from that when you said disruption, but it's all about love. So it's not a disruption to create havoc yeah. and more pain than there was before, but actually bring love yeah. to the experience. That's beautiful. Inviting into this bigger story. I mean, it's literally what Jesus did. He disrupted like crazy, yet it wasn't just to throw rocks at things. It was disrupting because the only way we change is through only way I get out of anything that I'm in, some yeah. kind of addiction or uh, proclivity to something, is that my routine is disrupted. Yeah, yeah. If you could leave something at the table today, mm. what would you leave me? I love your questions. So <laughs> great. I'd leave you a, a review saying great questions. <laughs> That's what I'd leave at the table. If I could leave you anything at the table, what would it be? Gosh, just a curiosity to what would it be look what would it look like to join Jesus today hmm. period just don't do it <laughs> please don't do it but like just stop to think if Jesus people started being more curious about him um and joining him i think we'd have a really different world i think we'd start looking like him can you imagine if Jesus people started looking like Jesus instead of religious whatever we look like. 
And so it really makes a hard it makes it hard for me sometimes to do what I do for a living because I go, gosh, we could sing all these songs all day long. And yet, is it changing anything in the in the rest of our week? Hmm. If it's not, I think we need to rethink what we're doing. Because I don't know if God really cares that much if we keep having more awesome worship services. And man, these songs are killing and CCLI charts are killing. And um, man, the church was on fire. God, God, great job on Sunday morning. But when somebody cuts us off, we consider ourselves better than them like I do. Man, that's not the way of Jesus. Tim, I'm speaking to myself. Hmm. Uh, when I see a candidate in the political scene that I completely disagree with, and I, then I, bec- I become, well, I other them. I make them the marginalized, and I make them my enemy. Man, I've just left the way of Jesus. But what would it look like if we Jesus people started joining him? Hmm. Oh, my gosh. Like yeah. different. This is a whole, that's a revolution. It is. And I, I, I just want to be part of the revolution. That he already started. I don't have to start anything. We don't have to start any cool revolutions. So. Yeah. Yeah. He's already built the table. He just wants <sighs> us to sit at it. So good. So right. Um, you've sat at a lot of tables in your lifetime, you know, probably when you were when you were yeah. small yeah, yeah, yeah. to now and whatever. Um, I want to ask if you can remember one moment, a memorable moment at a table that will stay with you forever. <sighs> That's unfair. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's so good. Um, a table moment that will last forever in my mind. Oh. Uh, they're flooding. They're flooding in. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish you could see my my imagination right now. Uh, I do think of one of my mentors when I was, and I, I actually don't like calling people mentors. I think people aim each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to be an aimer. Somebody who aims people to be who God created them to be, not mentor in the way that I am, but a guy that really aimed me and my friends early on. I remember being at his table. Uh, we'd be at his table every week, um, literally, and he would cook this amazing food. We'd sing songs. We'd like, he taught me poetry, he kind of put color to my black and white life. And Jesus was a part of that. And I, that table really changed me. Um, another table that changed me, I think, was the table when we'd spend time for three years um, with this motel community. That table was bonkers. I mean, some people were strung out, some really beautiful people, some whatever. And then you've got us who are probably all all the above and just sitting at that mutual table going, oh, we're the church. We don't ever have to do church again. Thankfully, Jesus, don't let me ever do church again. I just want to be it, period. Join you and be your church with these people. That was a really powerful table. Hmm. This is a, 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 it can be a tough question, but it, hopefully not. Um, who would you like to sit at the table with if you could? Like if you could invite anyone living or historical to your table for a chat or a meal, who would it be? And what would you hope to do or discuss or learn from that moment? Ooh, I mean, gosh, can you get any more cliche than Jesus? Um, but that would be pretty high in my list. Um, I would be, I would really be curious to be at a table with my parents when they were younger. Hmm. Um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, I would really be curious to be at a table with them and see how they grew up, why they grew up certain ways. And um, yeah, hmm. yeah, it's probably not your normal answer, but I, that's what pops into my head. Yeah, I asked my father that question before he passed, and he said his parents too. Huh. And he said that because um, he wanted to. Say how much he loved them. Mm. So I, I get yeah. Yeah, there's something there, huh? There is. Mm. Um, mm. If you sat with Jesus, though, if we if that did happen, I know you said Jesus, obviously. Yeah. But if you did, I, I guess the real question is, what would you say 
Oh, I have so many questions. I have so many questions. I want to know what he cares about. I really do. I I want to know what he cared and mostly what he cares about. What does the God, what does God, what does the heart of God care about? And I have had many thoughts. I've had many convictions of that over the years. I don't know if all those convictions are actual convictions or just opinions or small beliefs. Um, I want to know what he cares about, and I just want to be about that. But I, I'm, I'm not sure. And so it's part of the life of faith and curiosity is going, okay, God, I don't know. Is it this? Because I've been told that this is what you care most about. But I don't know. Help me. That's what I would say. Hmm. That's one of the hundred things I'd ask, but top of my list. Tim, I have one final question okay. for you. One final question. And for those listening to this podcast today who've maybe heard about this Jesus and this table but are hesitating on coming to that table, what would you say to them? Oh, I, I just, I wish, here's what I wish. I wish all of us could like, you know those in movies when somebody like zaps your memory hmm. and you just lose all the memory and... I wish that we could zap the history of what our image of God and the table is. Because the table that has been set for most people is a terrible table. Like, I want no part of that table. Like, it's so um, uh, discriminatory when Jesus was not at all. Hmm. I mean, gosh, we're just, I mean, just our community is going back through all the tables that Jesus sat at and invited people to. And it's just everybody, everybody everywhere. Like, what if that's actually true? Hmm. And I, I don't know how heaven works because I used to, again, know all these things. I just don't know how it all works anymore. <laughs> but I do know that the way of Jesus is so crazy beautiful. That like uh, let's just start there. I, if and if you're listening out there and you're going, I don't know about this whole thing. I don't know. Text me, <laughs> find me. I'd love to talk. So I'd love to learn stuff. But it's just, what if it's? Well, this is a crazy thought. What if Christians don't own Jesus? Number one, um, which if you want to throw stones, you go right ahead. But what if they don't own Jesus? What if he's just? What if he's huge? What if he's like bigger than our fit in our little system? I mean, Jesus Christians are are it mean should mean little Christs, um, and that's a hope. But yeah, gosh, <laughs> you're welcome at the table. You're welcome at my table. If I'm welcome at the table, you're welcome at the table. Tim Timmons, thank you for coming to the table. Mm, honored. Together at the Table. Together at the Table is an Integrity Music podcast and hosted by Andrew Phillips. The show is produced by Lasting Media Group. Our executive producers are Andrew Phillips and Jason B. Jones. Special thanks to Callie Argent, Bruna Balduino, Olivia Buchanan, Madison France, Alicia St. Gillet, Matt Lott, Noah Newman, and John Schneck. Our theme music is Good God, Lo-Fi Version by Special Music from their upcoming album, Still Worship, Lo-Fi, Volume 2. To listen to more lo-fi and Christian instrumental music, search for Still Worship wherever you listen to music. To learn more about Together at the Table, as well as Integrity Music, visit integritymusic.com. And to get more involved with the show, Follow us on socials at Together Table Pod. We've also set up a voicemail at 1 607 96 Table. That's 1 607 968 2253. If you have comments or questions, or you'd like to be a part of the show, please call and leave a message. Also, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our show wherever you listen to podcasts. This helps keep Together at the Table on the charts where people can find our show. Thank you once again 
for being with us together at the table.